Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, since the uh, webinar recorded, good time of the day to all the online viewers. Uh, my name is Andre, and uh, today I'm uh, presenting with my teammate, uh, Greg. We are a part of uh, gRPC security team, and we both uh, work for Google. Uh, definitely a bunch of really nice presentations uh, today before hours, so it's uh, tough to speak, especially uh, definitely, I think the presentations uh, with dinosaurs was uh, really, really amazing. <laughs> uh, so today is just an opportunity for us to present the latest progress to you, to gRPC community. And definitely, uh, thank you all for submitting uh, GitHub issues. And uh, separate shout out for reporting vulnerabilities. It's uh, really important for us, and uh, this is how uh, we progress. Um, also today, I noticed that uh, security itself, I think it was mentioned in pretty much all the decks with uh, different flavors. So uh, it's definitely a very important uh, topic nowadays. Um, also very excited that uh, there are even uh, international participants in the conference. And before we start, just a few words about the format. So again, since uh, uh, we are presenting together, uh, we have uh, two sections. We will try to split it uh, like uh, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Since we are a little bit late, I see people are still coming. Uh, and uh, leave like five minutes for questions at the end for uh, both of us. Uh, simultaneously, like uh, Kevin and Abhishek mentioned, we are around during the day, so uh, feel free to uh, reach out to us when we are in the lobby. We'll be happy to chat with you and uh, answer any questions uh, you might have. Okay, so uh, today we'll be talking about uh, advanced functionality of uh, gRPC security. Uh, what's uh, new there? So first of all, about uh, uh, ideology of the team, what uh, we are trying to achieve, what our design principles are. Uh, first one is uh, secure by default. And uh, second is uh, advanced configuration and uh, extensibility. So again, if I try to piggyback a dinosaur presentation, the first one is just buying a bag of dinosaurs. So uh, you grab something out of the box and you want to play with it, you want to test it, uh, you want to check if things are working as expected, and it should have some uh, meaningful default features. That's what we mean by secure by default. Um, talking about advanced configuration, uh, while I was checking different uh, issues on GitHub and questions on gRPC IO, uh, there are all different uh, use cases where gRPC is used and one really caught my attention. A uh, person was asking about uh, gRPC running on GoPro camera. So definitely uh, we cannot cover all the uh, potential uh, use cases like that. Um, but uh, the idea is that we provide flexibility for advanced users to implement the functionality they uh, needed. Um, so we're still adding features to advanced API, which is experimental across the languages. Uh, and uh, real experimental here means uh, it is already quite stable, but uh, we still want to add a few more features before officially uh, stabilizing it. And the latest features uh, we're going to discuss today, uh, they're like audit logging and uh, CRL. Uh, once we add all the features and uh, advanced API stabilizes, we make it public and uh, stable. And again, definitely we are welcoming all the community feedback if uh, you have some features in your mind and uh, our current interfaces do not allow uh, to implement that please reach out to us, please uh, raise issues on GitHub. Uh, we definitely cannot promise that uh, we'll be able to uh, work on all of that. Like it was mentioned before, there's all this competition for resources. Uh, so uh, upvoting also uh, makes a lot of sense. It helps us to understand that yes, this uh, feature, this request is needed by community. So talking about uh, 
uh, audit login. Um, why we are doing that? A few words about modern security environment. And again, uh, environment is designing things. Uh, first of all, uh, if you're listening to uh, the speaker who was from VMware talking about zero trust uh, security and zero trust architecture, um, then you are familiar with this stuff. Uh, but anyway, I'll just uh, do some kind of uh, refresher. So uh, zero trust architecture is a term by NIST. There is a publication. You can easily uh, Google that. So literally the idea is that it's a set of uh, cybersecurity paradigms uh, that move defenses from network-based, from static-based things um, to focus on users and resources. Uh, so access to resources is determined by dynamic policies and not by uh, protected perimeter uh, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, the other idea there is like trust is never granted implicitly and uh, we must be continually evaluating uh, what uh, authenticated user is trying to access. Do. Uh, in Again, in a lot of decks today, uh, it was uh, like two features were mentioned, MTLS and AOZ, uh, talking about AAA. So what exactly AAA is? It's uh, authentication, authorization, and uh, accounting. Literally, it's who is making the request. If uh, that uh, person is, uh, or the workload is allowed to do this kind of action. And the last A is tracking. So even if it's a successful event and uh, that person uh, is allowed to do things, we still want to track um, this stuff. So audit logging is uh, the third A. Uh, so right now, uh, after the 157 release, gRPC has all the AAAs. And uh, this is a uh, really nice feature because now we're covering all the A's. Um, talking about uh, use cases for uh, audit logging, uh, again, uh, it's uh, up to you how to, what features you need, but uh, we can uh, think about the following potential use cases. Uh, for example, if uh, you already have a policy and uh, dynamically it was changed, uh, it's a very good idea if uh, audit team requires that to leave some trace, literally. So, for example, you have uh, a policy with few roles and uh, another policy became active with different set of roles. Uh, by enabling audit logging, you can leave the trace in uh, uh, different in standard outlogger or other parts of the system, and it can be presented to auditing team that, hey, definitely a new policy is active right now. Uh, simultaneously, uh, there might be uh, admin users to execute the privilege requests. I don't know, for example, imagine the situation when a person works for a booking system and uh, they can cancel the bookings. It is a valid action, but uh, leaving such uh, trace, uh, it is also very helpful. Uh, outside detection, uh, Imagine the situation when you have a policy and everything is going fine, but you started to see a lot of denials. Definitely, it's a sign that something might be wrong and uh, it might be, again, uh, a notification for further investigation. And uh, another potential use case, uh, kind of um, uh, enforcement of uh, use it or lose it type of things. Imagine you have a policy with a bunch of roles. Uh, you keep monitoring the policy and you realize that hey, uh, the following paths, the following roles were not active for the last month or three months or whatever rule uh, you might have in your org. That's, again, another sign that uh, it's a potentially good idea to uh, revelate such roles and uh, policies. A uh, quick refresher about gRPC authorization. Again, here we're talking about uh, Proxyless. So this engine is built in in gRPC. Uh, built an engine, definitely uh, very fast. Uh, what you currently see on the screen, it's a kind of dummy file because real format is JSON or XDS, and uh, I omitted uh, some of the things. 
for simplicity, but uh, here we're talking about uh, dummy book service. So it's read information about books and deleting uh, information. And this file, uh, actually, it uh, protects delete action. You uh, need here a special role, special spiff ID, just to be able to execute this uh, delete action. Uh, talking about uh, audit logging, high-level design overview. So first of all, it's an uh, extension for authorization policy. It's a new section under the same file. Uh, it happens, it's getting executed after authorization decision is already made. And the uh, gRPC team, uh, we provide uh, some out-of-the-box loggers. Uh, right now, there is a standard out logger implemented and already available. So it's a very simple one. What it does, it uh, prints um, the login statements, which I cover later, to standard output. Uh, there are more uh, examples of that under testing section, so I encourage you to take a look. Uh, it shows you how to implement the things and how to register the things and definitely how to test them. Uh, if you want to do that, uh, again, as a power user, you can implement pretty much every logic and definitely, you know, beware because, for example, if you implement this interface and you start getting authorization decisions, uh, nothing can stop you from uh, starting storing this data in uh, remote databases. Right? We as GRPC team, we do not have any control. And uh, imagine uh, the performance uh, in that situation. You uh, got a GRPC server, very performant, and simultaneously during the flow, you uh, try to store information in external remote database. Even ping might be like a second or whatever. So definitely it's a very powerful mechanism and just be careful with that. Um, what uh, you, what metadata you got, let me just go to the next slide. So uh, what you see here is uh, metadata available uh, for you. What uh, is available is definitely full method name. Again, here I'm uh, covering our dummy uh, bookstore service. Uh, also have a principal, so uh, who made the request, uh, policy name, uh, it might be, for example, a file, here we have uh, my bookstore yeah. file, um, uh, matched rules, so which exact rule the request matched, and authorization uh, decision. So, for example, in uh, this scenario, uh, it is false because uh, uh, a user a regular user cannot delete a book. Uh, now, uh, the last slide, how to do a very simple hello world, how to enable the things. Again, uh, I'm just uh, omitting a good chunk of the policy file, but you see at the end there is a new section named uh, audit uh, logging options. And under that, we have audit condition on deny. The thing to keep in mind uh, that uh, deny here is uh, actually outcome. So it's outcome based. Both allow rules and both deny rules, they can produce uh, denial, for example. Um, and uh, the last few lines about the audit logger, you see there is a name, uh, standard out logger. It's again pre built logger, which is uh, available. And uh, definitely it's already registered. So if you just add these few lines of codes, you can uh, again uh, run some requests. And this is a sample outcome uh, you might see. Again, there is another uh, JSON wrapper around that, but uh, the metadata, uh, this is a good sample of metadata you are uh, going to uh, see. Uh, again, this is a built-in logger. If uh, you would like to implement uh, something on your own. This would be like very, very similar. And again, I encourage you to take a look at uh, testing examples and you will even see how it's possible to combine multiple loggers uh, in one. Thank you, Greg. Hey everybody, uh, my name's Gregory and I'm here to just talk a little bit about what we've been doing with the certificate revocation lists. So, 
to kind of discuss CRLs, first we have to all get on the same page about uh, public key infrastructure or PKI. Um, this is a very deep topic and I'm just gonna really scratch the surface, um, but I just wanna make sure we all are kind of on the same page. So to use an example that a lot of us probably do every day, you, you go to uh, your favorite website on your browser, uh, google.com, um, and then Google will present you a certificate and your browser knows how to take that certificate and verify that this google.com is actually truly the google.com that you wanna to connect to and not somebody spoofing that information. Uh, that certificate comes from somebody called a certificate authority that they're responsible for issuing certificates. Uh, and your browser trusts them, Google trusts them, they're, they're trusted, they're a trusted other party. So that certificate authority can also issue certificate revocation lists saying, hey, uh, I, I did issue this certificate, but now you don't want to use it anymore. It's not good. Um, variety of reasons, maybe a private key leaked. Um, you know, it's just a, a good thing to be able to do. And RFC 5280 uh, defines the X509 standard for certificates and certificate revocation lists. If you really want to dive deep into uh, that standard for uh, internet PKI. Thinking more about gRPC, it's not like a human on a browser connecting to a website, but more service to services. A lot of times wanting to do uh, mutual authentication with each other. And in this case, uh, your organization, whoever you're running gRPC for, probably has a team that's in charge of uh, and is your certificate authority. They're creating certificates, certificate revocation lists, distributing them all over your fleet. Um, and often they're, they're kind of on the disk of the servers that maybe your microservices are running on. Um, so that, that's what CRLs are. Um, so hopefully you understand why we want to be able to support them in gRPC. So the current support is uh, very tightly coupled to OpenSSL and it's not the best. So it's, it uses this, this function called X509 lookup hashter and this sets a very specific requirement on a directory and how the files in that directory are formatted to be able to read CRLs. So that means that now your PKI has to be dependent on something the gRPC is doing, which we don't like. We don't wanna force you to do something with your PKI. And there's, there's zero flexibility for you to do other things. Um, another issue with it, because it's kind of based in OpenSSL, um, languages like gRPC Go that uh, implement their own stack, they don't use OpenSSL. Uh, we've had to re-implement this behavior and that just leads to like tiny inconsistencies in security. And uh, that's also just kind of annoying for everybody that's trying to use it. Uh, and this is kind of what it looks like. Um, the, I hope that y'all can read that highlight. The, you just, create your channel credentials options and you can set a CRL directory. And then as you pass these channel credentials through to your channel, you create the channel, you make connections. And during the handshake, it will use the credentials in this directory. So what we're trying to do better is follow the design principles that Andre talked about. Uh, we we wanna make a CRL provider interface that is flexible and overridable and is is easy to use but also has the flexibility for you if you want different behaviors uh, it's also really nice uh, we already have credentials and credential providers so it, it's a really nice uh, semantic consistency in the api you know if you see credential providers and you're implementing something with that you probably also want to implement something with crl providers um, and on the third point that andre talked about uh, we we're trying to provide these kind of batteries included good default implementations that we hope will cover many, many use cases that are very common. Um, so for example, there we have things like static, which is give us a CRL string and we'll, we'll make sure we use it. And then periodic reloading of directories. It's, it's very common to be distributing these things as a server runs and being able to have your gRPC server not have to restart to read in new CRL files that get distributed to your machine is definitely a pro. You don't, you don't wanna have to restart your server whenever you distribute new credentials and CRLs. Um, so 
I decided to use some pseudo-ish Go code for this example, um, but this is uh, what you can expect it to look like. It's not currently in the code base yet, but it should be quite soon. Um, but right, it's very simple. All you have to do is override git CRL, and you'll get a CRL associated with some certificate you're trying to verify. Um, so on the on the back end of this interface, you can implement whatever you want to store and get CRLs, and then just return them through this interface. And then it kind of cascades through the options the same way that uh, the other option did, where you have your options, and then you'll set this provider. And now when this server goes to do a handshake and verify a certificate during the handshake, it'll go ask this provider, give me a CRL so that I can verify the certificate. So that's uh, pretty much all I have on uh, certificate revocation. And, uh, and uh, we're back for uh q and session. If uh, you have any questions for any of this topic, we'll be happy to uh, answer. Cool. Any questions, anyone? No? So the authority policies that you have shown are specifically on this field. Okay. The authority policy that you have shown, the principles are specifically on the um, SPIFI IDs, which are from the certificates. I yeah. assume. Is there a um, reason why we did not use regular username password? Um, so regular users with username password types of authentication cannot go through the authority policies? Uh, so that's a... Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So it's a slightly different uh, idea in general because uh, on the policy side, uh, the user or the workload is already authenticated, right? So uh, it's uh, actually doesn't really know like Spiffy or how exactly it was obtained, like uh, via username, password, or anything like that. It just uh, you know uh, enables for you to create a set of rules, and uh, you just know exactly your infrastructure. Uh, how user or workload is authenticated. Hi. I have a question on audit logging. Um, uh, so um, in the audit logs, we have a full meta name, right? Uh, but uh, what if uh, our um, allow or deny decision based on, uh, or can it be based on the internals of the RPC message? So is, for example, if only some subset of books uh, we can delete or not, like by book ID or some book category. Uh, so something that is not in the uh, full method name. Uh, yeah, that's uh, a good question. So it is uh, not about audit logging itself, but uh, it's about how uh, authorization uh, uh, engine itself uh, works. So uh, right now, as far as I remember, like there are very different uh, types of matchers. And uh, yes, you know, it is quite powerful. Uh, for example, you even can rely on uh, different headers and so on and so on. Uh, so definitely encourage you to check the JRFC for authorization engine itself. Uh, it is also like open source and released, and uh, you can find all the different details and mechanisms there. And again, since uh, Audit Logger is an extension, right, it just uh, takes uh, the decision itself. Wonderful. Oh, one more question. For the CRL uh, provider, um, I would like to ask um, how often is the provider pulled? Because, uh, you know, like getting the CRL could be a time consuming pro procedure. So if it's pulled every, for every re incoming request, does that mean there are some caching policy, uh, a caching mechanism required on the provider implementation, something like that? 
Right. So every every time you're doing a handshake and and you want to verify certificates, you're going to want to get CRLs. So the idea is that yeah, you you'd have it stored in memory definitely on the provider. So when this function gets called, it can just return something very very quickly uh, in memory because it's kind of like on the critical path of of making a connection. It's during the handshake. Um, so there's definitely uh, you you would not want to like make a network call out to fetch a CRL every time you called this. You'd want to have something that that loaded it asynchronously and and would return it from from memory. Yeah. So so just to clarify, so what you mean is that part of responsibility is for the CRL provider, it's not in gRPC. Right. Okay. Thank you.